Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 17th Verzio Film Festival. I'm Borbala Chukash, the industry coordinator at Verzio, and I'm very honored to present you, Nenat Polovsky. I would like to say a few words before you start. So Nenad uh, founded Factum in uh, 1997, which is a leading Croatian independent documentary production. In uh, the 20 years of its existence, it produced more than 80 documentaries shown uh, at more than 80 festivals. And in 2005, uh, Nenad founded Zagreb Docs, the biggest international documentary film festival in the region. He has been its director ever since. For his work uh, on documentary film, particularly for launching and managing Zagreb Docs, he received in 2009 the European Documentary Network Award and Medal of the City of Zagreb. He's a professor of documentary directing at the Academy of Dramatic Arts in Zagreb, and he's also a jury member now at uh, Versio this year. Um, one last thing to the audience, you can leave your questions and comments on Facebook and on the website as well. And I will be collecting them until around 6.30 and I will read the questions to Nenad at the end of his masterclass. So that's it from me and thank you very much Nenad again for being here and I will let you do what you do. <laughs> Whatever I do, that's good. Uh, so I'll do whatever, whatever I do, and I hope sound is going to be okay. Um, I would like to thank for the opportunity to be with you. I would prefer, of course, to have it uh, really live uh, in terms of physical presence and to have uh, something to uh, maybe to drink uh, during the masterclass, but. Uh, the situation is that we are all online and it's good that we are because it's good for our safety and our health. And I will try to uh, really give you some uh, insight if in what I've been doing uh, in field of documentary uh, for many years uh, in terms of my own work because I also did a number of documentaries myself, but also as a uh, teacher and producer. Uh, the, the overall issue I'm going to tackle is really something that's not often discussed, and that's uh, mostly the relation uh, between people. Uh, between people, uh, in terms of what's happening to the filmmakers and also to the people in the documentaries during the shoot and after the shoot. That's something that's not often tackled, you know, when you finish and you edit your film. Basically, you usually deal with uh, festival distribution awards, uh, uh, going to the screenings, meeting the public, uh, public's Q&A. But uh, the documentary are very different from any other kind of films because we are dealing with real humans. We are dealing with people who have their lives uh, and their lives changed. And uh, the approach to the films you did with them also in time. So I will, I, will, um, I will start with a film I did many years ago as a film student. It was 1972. And I was a student of film school. Um, and uh, we were shooting a film, uh, 16 mil reversal. You don't know what reversal is, but it's something like slides. You don't have negative and positive if you have only one one tape and uh, the shooting ratio, uh, which is unbelievable today, was one to four. So if we made a film of 20 minutes, we got, uh, we got 80 minutes of the film and that's it. So I chose, I've chosen to make a film about a young girl uh, who was a kind of talk of the town, some strange girl, uh, a very, open girl, the girl that lived in different ways, and also the girl who broke 
some cliches of the environment we lived then, but also the girl who tried many creative things and tried to express herself in dance, in pottery, in different fields. Also a girl that had a lot of uh, boyfriends at that time, which was, you know, 60s, 70s, so it was just very, very engaging. So I will show you now uh, a clip, uh, and then I will tell you what happened to the film and to the girl, uh, because that's a part of, as I said, what we do. Okay, I will press a few buttons and I will start. It should start now and starting. Sjećam se dobro kad plešem, ne mogu plesati, užasno se osjećam, boli me, sve me boli. Nemam ni svojih ruku, ni nogu, ni ništa nema. Osjećam, osjećam se da ne mogu, da sam hajdan, da to tak daleko da bi trebala ponovo raditi, naprosto srame i imam osjećaj da je muzika svira, da ja trčim da je vrede. Da je muzika presavušna da to neće. Kako je to uhodilo? Dame, sveće, šest, sedam, osam. Devet, sve zajedno kad ti srećemo od prvog dana, ne? Devet. I zakaj ste prekinali zapravo? Pa čovjek si našao drugu žensku, ne? A ne, nije to taj razlog. Nije, nije. A čovjek, pa ne može se. Sve devet meseci i deset dana ne možeš ići, pa onda prekineš. A nije, nisam našao drugu žensku. Nije, nije. Ne, ja mislim, ti si meni rekao šta je razlog, ali ovaj... Ali si isto vremena i si tamo dolazio, tamo, tako i... Ja nisam znao nju. 
Ne znam da se znao, ti se sviđalo, ali ne i tamo nije ni poznao. Prvi put sam je poznao mjesec dana posle. Nisam ja ne uopće znao. Nisam ozbiljno. Ja... Pa mjesec dana, pa čak i kasnije dva mjeseca posle. Ja sam tam dolazio jer mi se sviđala, ne radi neke ženske. E pa da, pa to je ona bila, ne? Dođem ja kužiš na čagu, ne? I vidim on odmah poslije toga drugi tjedan, ne? To kaj dva mjeseca poslije? Kad sam vas vidio na čagu, ste se tamo gledali i ljubili. Tijen dana poslije toga. Kaj smo nas da prekinuli, ne? I je, pa to je bila ona. A čuj, mislim, ja sam sretna što sam s njim prekinula u stvari što je. Ja sam sam užasno osjećala, puno kompleksa sam imala, ono, da sam glupa blesava, kod njega, kod njega doma, bilo mi je očeno, sjedila sam tamo satima, prošli što budem s njim, zima mi je bilo stalno. Čuj, pa možete visiti, ja dođem kod njega u 5 sati popodne, od doma, ali pobegnem, normalno, jer doma mi je grozno bilo. Od doma pobegnem, dođem tu i onda sad imaš jedno 5-6 sati. Ma kak' je 5-6 sati? Do 20 sata u noći šutiš, znaš, i sediš i čekaš i ne znaš uopće šta čekaš. I onda na kraju idemo, evo ga, nas dva ostanemo sami i onda smo pol sata zajedno i sad se ide, sad jedem peške doma, kužiš. I ja te pratim. I eventualno, ne, na početku si imaš pratit, poslije se mi tu i tamo pratim. Ma znam koliko puta bi šla sama vrati. Da da obzirom, mislim, ja sam ja išla i ne, ali se meni teško bilo koga se dignuti. Ima umorna, dođem doma, sva ispijena, plavičasta, razumiješ, a moja mama uopće neće da mi gleda. Neće da mi gleda. A kad sam pokazala slike, one što smo se slikali, nisu te vakse, ja dođem, pokažem im slike, oni uopće neće gledati. Vada, dajte, pogledajte. Niš, samo mi je bilo grozno, slisali su teško, znaš. I tako su bili nesretni. I ja isto ne. Mada kada ovoga, kad gledam one slike, pa ti onda se pože... Onda se, onda, znaš ono, vratim se u to isto, ono, kretimo, sad se te ne volim, kad zmišljaš, te nisam volila, pregriš, te ne volim. Ali ima jedna sekunda kad te strahovito volim, užasno ono... Ali samo kad uzmem te slike ili kad se, ili kad se totalno vratim, kad vidim zapravo... Ne imam, mislim, ni slike, ni ništa, nego tebe vidim. Jer mi dođe da urlam. To je sve prošlo. Kaj je bilo ova tvar djevojka s filmove? Je. Tako, mladen, daj ti mi jedno lepo reći jednu stvar. Da li si se ti onda liječio i da li si te uzimao onda pirule kad smo ne trebali se liječiti ili si ti to namirno izbjegao? Što se, pa da. Uđenio se, da. Jesi. Da. I kak sam ja onda opet bila bolesna? Ja isto. Da. A zakaj si rekao da nisi? Rekao sam ti da jesi. A rekao si da jesi? Da. A ja čoveka. Kako ne? Nek, ti si kad smo išli dole, kod tebi kad sam došla, ti smo već prekinali. Onda sam ja tebe pitala se ti uzima, ti si rekao da nisi, da ti nisi uopće prosim, ti nemaš ništa. Onda sam je rekla da neću da ti ovo malo zaražiš, onda si rekao kaj se to mene tiče. I tak. I da kod nao s kim sam ja bila, da kaj sam ja dobila od koga. Hey, uh, why did I show you this? Well, it was quite an interesting situation. Uh, <clears throat> when I finished the film, it got, uh, it went to the festival, national festival, and it got an award. It was quite a sensation because 
it was 70s. And people did quite different documentaries at the time. But the, <clears throat> the most interesting issue here was not that. It was that the main, uh, main protagonist, the girl, was very excited about the film and she liked it. Obviously, in the second part of this clip, she was uh, talking with her former boyf boyfriend about STD, uh, sexually transmitted disease, they both had. And she didn't, she didn't really care about it, but it was okay. Some 15 years after that, uh, my school wanted to show a number of films on, the, on national television. And this film was on the program. And the girl uh, gave me a call and said, you, you are not going to show this. I said, what's the problem? She said, I don't want this to be seen. I said, well, but it was seen so many times. No, 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 I have, I have a little daughter and I don't want she to, hear the, uh, she to see the film. And I said, look, what can I do if you really insist I'm not going to show it, but, and so on and so on. And so we didn't, we didn't show the film. Uh, 20 years later, 20 years after that happened, I organized my personal retrospective in Art Cinema in Zagreb. And I programmed this film. It was one small cinema. And I said, okay, I want to show this film. That's my first serious documentary. And what happened is that this girl, and she was now a grown up woman, came to the screening with the same daughter for whom she didn't want uh, 15 years ago to see the film and said, look, I want her to see the film. Why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because whenever you deal with real people, you never really know what kind of reactions you are going to have. And that's not only uh, about, you know, approval or signatures or piece of paper. It's about that our films are really changing somebody's lives. And in, in 35 years or more, um, the destiny of this film uh, completely changed. It was accepted, it was awarded, it was banned, and it was again, uh, again approved by the protagonist of the film. You never know, in, in 20 years, when I'm not around, uh, something else could happen. Maybe the granddaughter could come and say, I don't want this film to be shown. So you have to really, or one has really, you have all this in mind. And this is very rarely talked about uh, in our productions, in our film schools, in our professional environment. Now I'm going to show you another film and all of my films have kind of a history, and I want to talk to tell you about this. The second film you are going to see was officially banned for more than 15 years. I, I shot it in 1976. In fact, I was just married and I used a week I got uh, for my honeymoon to shoot this film. My, my wife approved it, I, so I, I didn't go to my uh, regular job. I shot this film for television. And it was uh, a very tough situation. It was a kind of asylum uh, outside Zagreb for uh, people, for a kind of the, of the people nobody really wanted. There were mentally, uh, mentally uh, ill people, there were people, uh, uh, there were drugs, drugs addicts, prostitutes, uh, uh, homeless people, you know, the lowest part of the society altogether in an old, old building, almost a kind of a castle in, in, uh, in Croatia. <coughs> so I shot this film. I will uh, show you 
now the the uh, part of a clip of this film and then tell you what happened with this film and why what was the uh, excuse this time Šta mi se, zašto se ovdje? Ja sam obojila na živce. Kako to da ste se tu našli skupo? Pa tako, evo vidite, film prilike. Bili smo, ja sam tako malo alkoholično naujen, rapci popijen. Sinje ti misli da mi mora slediti i tako. Oni rekli da plot na vodno ne pada daleko od sabla i tako. Smo se našli sute na skuptu. Kako to da ste u piđami? Kako to da ste u piđami? Sam se skidam, ali ću biti. Kaj je bilo te učer? Napio se i pao i razbio se i... Ništa sad, nisam među ljude. Za ište da se pokažem, među pošto i narod, jer smatram da sam alkoholičar, veliki pijalnac i... A zakaj ste vičer pili onda? Zakaj sam pil? Vičer, da. Pa to mi je moja već četiris godina profesija. Kako dugo ste ovdje? Sedma godina ide. Prihvatilište je ovaj osnova 1953. godine i kao socijalna ustanova. Ona je od posebnog društvenog interesa u oblasti socijalne zaštite. Reci nam kako vam je ovdje? Dobro. Što radite cijeli dan? Tako. Ili kartama ili ovako nešto. Neko vreme sam, kad ovako, kad sam nervozan, onda počnem razbijati prozor, kad to... Reci mi, da li ti smataš da si bolestan ili nisi? 
Pa ču te, možda sam, možda i ču te, čovjek u današnje vrijeme, ja sam, mislim, radio elektroinstalaciju. Možda imam neke, e, kao električar, ne? Možda imam neke halucinacije više elektronske, znači što te? Ili mi je to u struki, ne? Da, da. Pa kad imam neke halucinacije više elektronski i primao sam neke elektrošokove, znači što te? Onda sam, možda sam za jednog normalnog čovjeka psihički bolestan. Ali možda, za jednog, možda i za vas sam bolestan, možda za nekog doktora nisam bolestan i tako, ne? Ja sam bez zaposlenja i otišao sam u Austriju, tam sam se zaposlio. Onda sam ilegalno prešao u granicu Austrijsku Njemačku i tam sam zatražio politički azir. I od onda su, onda su mi počeli poganjati, eto i u Sloveniji. A zašto politički azir se zatražili? Zašto ja sam bio ranije na rogbi kao politički krivac. Gdje? Ja sam na otoku u Sveti Grgur. Onda sam bio na, na Ugljanu, Bileći i Golom otoku na kraju. A zbog čega? Nagodno neprijateljska propaganda agitacija. Šta je bilo, možete na većem? Molim? Šta je zapravo bilo? A šta je zapravo? Među su mi razgovor, ako sa nekima, u stvari provokatorski jedan razgovor, jedan, dva, i bilo je dovoljno, dobijem pet godina. Prvi put, drugi puta, dvije godine, poslije šest mjeseci istrage. Pa javljaju se, evo i sad razgovaraju sa mnom, to nema šta tu, nisam nikakve, nikakve što ja znam, e, psihički defekt neki kod mene ili što ja znam, neka halucinacija, e, to je sigurno, to nema šta. Na, na koji način se to o, manifestira? Na koji način se manifestuje? Pa do, budem doveden u tako razdrživo stanje, onda apatično stanje, bolove osjećam, na primjer, Kaže, evo sad, sad ćeš imati i šijalgiju. Strahovitu i šijalgiju sam ovaj, dobio, radio sam dok sam bio na izdržavanju kazne u tim osam puta. Radio sam na građevini i strahovitu i šijalgiju. I za tri dana nestalo je. To čujete da vam neko kaže nešto ili, ili vam... Da kaže, vedo, stalno, stalno, tu nema, tu nema trenutka da sa mnom se ne razgovara. Tu nema trenutka. Kako? Molim? Tko razgovara? Muški i ženski glas. Muški i ženski glas. Kamo spadaju oni? Beogradu. Kamo točno? U, u vojsku ili kamo? Oni kažu da su vojna policija. U ovom domu u Bidružici postoje nekoliko kategorija štićenika. Dušeno za ostale osobe, dušeni bolesnici, alkoholičari, bivše prostitutke, gerijadrijski slučajevi. Zašto su sve te osobe u jednom te istom domu? U ovaj dom su smještene te osobe vjerojatno prvenstveno radi toga što naša služba nije dovoljno razvijena. Pa smo smjestili, odnosno smješteni su čisto stihijom. Za vas kažu da ste jedan od najboljih poznavaca filmova u Zagrebu. Pa tako, priča se. Pa kad sam uvijek gledao, jel? kad sam se bavio s tim šircom, onda sam i odmah ovaj, kako se zove, odmah i gledao film, čim je bila prva premjera, evo. Koji film je najbolje išao? Uopće, za koliko vi znate. A najbolji film je išao, ali ovaj 40. duka, to je bilo, još sam ja bio klinac. Išla je bila rasprodana u Balkan, sigurno jedno tri mjeseca. Recimo, jednu od najboljih stvari sam dobio od GTA. Pjesma o sreći. Zadnji dio kaže, es gibt kein Glück auf Erden, als wollen, was man soll. Nema sreće na svijetu, nego htjeti ono što moraš. E sad, ako ja moram biti u domu, a ja to hoću, više problema nema. Je li tako? Jedna... Vrlo gadna situacija, mi smo stanovali u tom domu gdje ti ljudi su smješteni. Oni, kao što vidite, sorry, I, I started aggression. As you can see, uh, it was a quite a tough situation and uh, uh, we, uh, the small crew, there were only uh, three of us, my cinematographer, sound person and myself, we were staying at the same uh, place uh, in the same uh, facility where these uh, uh, people were uh, placed 
Um, they didn't have any special care. Uh, psychiatrists would come uh, six months, uh, six times a month, and that was it. Um, they were really placed there, you know, to stay and to die. Uh, and uh, since my wife is a very clever person, I remember I was uh, not in Croatia for some time, and she told me that I got a big fee uh, for this film, a bigger fee than uh, normal. And I was very happy about it. But she said, don't be happy. That sure means they're not going to show it. I said, come on, you know, of course they're going to show it. And television didn't show it. So when I came back, I went to the commissioning editor and said, look, uh, why didn't you show the film? And he, who was uh, a very usually very nice, kind man, uh, a person who uh, was an intellectual filmmaker himself, said, look, Nenad, this is a terrible film. This is unhuman. I said, it's not the film that's an unhuman. It's the conditions that people the these people live in, uh, which are unhuman, not the film. The film is only showing, and not even the worst cases, it's showing what's going on. And he said, no, we are not going to show it. This is not what our country is. This is not what socialism is. This is not how we can, how we deal with people. So, a guy who was normally a very nice, open-minded person, who was, of course, also politically uh, correct, uh, uh, being an uh, editor at television, uh, put this film aside, and it wasn't shown for more than 15 years. After uh, Croatia broke from Yugoslavia in 19. 1991, uh, I went to another uh, commission editor who was then in charge, and who was an opposite guy, who was also very uh, politically uh, pro-socialist and pro-communism, and he was much tougher than the first one, but now he switched to the new government and to the new ideology and to the Croatian and so on and so on and so on. But I knew him because he was, um, when I was uh, a young boy uh, working in this youth, uh, youth uh, building sites, you know, the, uh, during the summer people, would, uh, young people would go and build whatever. So I went uh, just to have fun and to be with some girls, not really for any other reason. And he was the, uh, the person in charge of ideology, ideology. So he was very strict, much stricter than the first one. But then he said, uh, of course, I'm going to show the film. This is a perfect film. So 15 years after the first one said no, who was normally a nice guy, uh, a, very, a much rigider guy, uh, let it be shown. Uh, another interesting thing is that uh, the doctor, the psychiatrist you see in the film, uh, uh, who was a very strange and disturbed person by himself, uh, uh, and it took us six takes to have a decent statement. His family came to me after they saw the film and said, could we have the film, please? Because it's the only uh, uh, recording of our, our father. So again, uh, be aware of the fact that films, the impact of the films and their destiny, number one, very often is not in your hands. And number two, changes uh, uh, in time. Very often, uh, regardless of what you want and what you plan 
uh, with the film. So again, um, I was doing uh, the, uh, the best, the most honest film. And uh, now this is regarded to be one of the important films, blah, 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 blah. But nobody saw it for 15 years, nobody. And even, to, uh, I, sh I showed it only once before it was shown on television after uh, the, the formation of Croatia. I show it in one uh, in national library. They asked me to show it. And uh, a lot of people, intellectuals, uh, came, you know, to see the film. And there was one uh, historian uh, who was a film historian who was also a, a member of one of the new political parties, Croatian political parties. And after he saw this film, uh, he said, well, it's a great film. It's only pity that it, it was not banned because it was for Croatia. I said, no, it was banned for completely other reasons. He said, yes. he said, yeah, yeah. But it would be much better if, if it was banned because it was for Croatia and not uh, for these people. So again, um, you never know. Uh, now I'm going to show you the film I did in 98. <coughs> in fact, I, I finished it in 98. I shot it uh, earlier. Uh, I found I spent some time in England uh, teaching at the uh, English film school. And I found out that there was one guy, uh, English guy, uh, his name was Graham Benford, who put himself uh, and on fire, a light uh, in the front of the British Parliament. And uh, it was quite uh, downplayed with, uh, by British media because uh, they didn't want to show that. And also the reason he put himself a light was um, uh, the war in Bosnia and specifically something that happened in one village in Bosnia, which is called Ahmici, where uh, Croatian forces in Bosnia uh, burned, burned out uh, houses with people in them. And uh, I will show you again a clip. I will also show you the way I put together the film. Because um, when I came after the shooting, I found out that because the guy was not around, there was no, apart from one picture, and there was not really anything about the event and so on and so on. I decided that I will make a kind of double story because he was my generation. I will make a double story of him and myself. And uh, the previous film was called Dead Harbor. And this one uh, is called Graham and I, Graham Bamford and my humble self. So you will see another clip. The British then took their patrol through Ahenichi, where the worst of these atrocities was alleged to have occurred. This is or was a Muslim village of some 400 people. The infantry then went on a foot patrol to look for more casualties or evidence of atrocities. They didn't have far to search. They came upon a house in the center of the village where a family of seven had died. Two in the stairway, another five in the cellar. It's hard to look at some of these pictures, harder to tell the story of Ahenichi without them. What happened here can frankly not be shown in any detail. 
but the room is full of the charred remains of bodies and they died in the greatest agony. It's hard to imagine in our continent and in our time what kind of people could do this. The impact on it, do you think I don't forget? Every day I remember what I saw. The, the first impression was not to believe your eyes. You can't, indeed your eyes don't even, when I saw in a cellar four women and two children, and then after that, Christ, I smelt it, and I staggered out, and my soldiers held me up as I was sick. And it was something that was discussed um, quite strongly at the time, um, particularly by, by guys who were there. I mean, one in particular was, you know, um, a warrant officer with 19, 20 years service in the army, married with a couple of children, um, and the guy broke down and cried because he had actually gone in and seen, you know, the skeletons of a, a mother holding two children, um, you know, in the cellar of a building. I was deeply affected by it because it's difficult to confront in your own mind the possibility that people can do this in a supposedly civilized part of the world in the, in the 20th century. So it had a, a big effect on me and I, I remember for the reporters are supposed to have a way with words. I was literally speechless with horror. I had great difficulty getting the words out that day and it's the only time in my life it's been like that. Look, I, I think all the Western nations, all the so-called civilized nations, failed in this and failed utterly. And that failure was a failure of leadership, it was a failure of understanding. I think they were behind their people in this. Many, many of ordinary British citizens understood the importance of this, including probably Graham Bamford, better than our leaders. It was when the atrocities were being committed in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina that um, it affected him most because of, uh, he was worried about his daughter and losing his daughter. And then the photographs we had here with the women and children um, I think affected him very deeply. He was tremendously upset about what he saw on our television screen to such an extent that uh, he, co he couldn't look at it at one stage. He just got up and went to his bedroom and we didn't see him for the rest of, uh, of the evening. In 1989, I made The Borderline of Hunger, a documentary about growing hunger in former Yugoslavia. At that time, social and political turmoil shook the country, but paradoxically, that was also the time of the greatest freedom. Rationally, I was aware that a war was coming, but like many others, didn't want to believe it. In the same period, I also directed a television feature about a middle-aged anarchist who couldn't adapt to the society he lived in, attempted to put himself alight, and later died. In 1990, I even directed the Eurovision Song Contest. Unfortunately, there was no music that could silence the sound of the air raid sirens and the coming war. My family and myself spent a good part of the autumn and winter of 1991 in the cellar. 
Zagreb, my hometown, was bombed, but not a fraction as much as other parts of the country. However, it was hard to look at the wreckage in the center of the old town. As a filmmaker, I did the only thing I could. I made films about and against the war. Foremost, the film about Vukovar, the city I knew and loved. I collected the footage from all possible sources, but mostly from its citizens who managed to get out of the town. The horror of the war was unraveling in front of my eyes. The horror which Graham, contrary to so many world politicians, could not stand. Okay. Yes. Uh, the film I shot in, uh, it was the first film I shot for Factum. In, in, in a way, uh, I wanted to check, is it going to work at all? A kind of independent production, because at that time, in early 90s, um, there was no independent production in Croatia. There was only state television and a couple of films which were supported by Minister of Culture, but they were heavily controlled by the government and uh, there was no independent production. And uh, I showed this film uh, mostly in England. I got uh, um, some money from Soros Foundation and some money from other sources, non-official sources, no state force sources. And um, we, we had uh, each year a national, Croatian national uh, short film festival, short, short film and documentary film festival. But this film was not accepted uh, to that festival. And the uh, justification for that was that um, it was terrible that I mixed my own story with the story of Graham Belford. And I was even called in one article a uh, war profiteer because who can do this kind of terrible stuff, putting himself in, into one uh, own film. You have to understand that uh, uh, that was probably the first documentary that had this kind of autobiographical elements at that time. Uh, which is practically uh, uh, 30 years ago, there was no autobiographical films. Uh, but of course, the real reason was that the Croatian uh, forces were the forces which did uh, what uh, really uh, triggered this guy to kill, him, to kill himself. So again, um, I'm taking you through <laughs> through um, the reactions and people and all of that. And the funny stuff was that Paddy Ashton, who, who is in my film, uh, became a governor, a kind of governor of Bosnia later, and I met him. And he was, of course, MI6. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, intelligent. But uh, he, I met him in Sarajevo and we discussed this. And uh, the, the story of Graham Belfort is uh, really still downplayed in, in Great Britain uh, because that was not something that uh, they liked to show. And also, I tried to, uh, to get some, su for, some support from British uh, broadcasters. And I have it in writing, and it's even in, in the film, the, the, the screenshot. I got from a very famous, uh, from a very famous commissioning editor, British, who said literally this, we've done Bosnia for this year. So that was the answer. Uh, on the other hand, you know, in 90s, I remember I went to another, I went to BBC to a very famous, uh, again, a very famous commissioning editor, who, by the way, had a degree in anthropology. 
you know, BBC, they're all the intellectuals, Oxford, uh, Cambridge, they're high class and so on. You know? So uh, I presented him the project and he said, well, we say blah, blah. Of course, I knew it. it's not going to happen. But then at the end of our conversation, he asked me, look, then I have a question. So he was the commission editor of BBC with a degree in anthropology. And he asked me the, the following question. He said to me, well, Leonard, I'm interested. If you see a Serb on the street, do you know that he is a Serb? And I said, sorry? And he said, yeah, the Serb is coming towards you uh, in the street. Do you know that he is a Serb? I said, what do you mean? He has a green hair or, you know, whatever. So that was at that time, the level of understanding uh, uh, about what's going on in, in uh, former Yugoslavia. So again, uh, some issues, <coughs> some issues with the firm. Now let's move on. Um, in, uh, uh, that was 97, 98. And, um, in 2002, I made um, a film about a pavilion on Zag in Zagreb Fair, where people were brought in and investigated, practically tortured, and then moved uh, to other parts of uh, Croatia and uh, very often killed. Most of them were Serbs, and uh, there were not hundreds, but there were quite a number of people. And it was um, done by a uh, group of uh, paramilitary uh, uh, police that was um, led by a guy called Merchuk. And uh, my main uh, witness was a guy you are going to see who confessed uh, publicly that he killed some 25 people himself. And it was quite complicated to get him to be in the movie. And I will tell you more about him and other issues uh, regarding this film. Uh, uh, later, after you see uh, this clip. So the Pavilion 22, it's called. At the very time, we saw the Dogadio, the Chudne Stvari. Nestarly su ljudi, koliko ja znam, nestarly su ljudi. Ljudi su pjačkani po gradu. Zagrebu i sva dobit je dovoljena na Gadosa. Da ne bi danas sutra bilo tko od ministara mogao biti prozvan, da mu netko kaže ti si u to vrijeme bio ministar, najlakše reći ja nisam znao. Kao što danas i govori. A nije znao što se događa, mada svi debelo su znali što se događa na Gadosa.
sajam, svodilo se na sljedeće. Dobili ste papirić na šanku stila, išlo se na adresu koja je naznačena na papiru i čovjek se dovodio na vele sajam. U većini strojeva je se kratko državao, jer je već organiziran, bile su dvije ekipe ljudi, jedna koja je dovodila do vele sajma, a druga od vele sajma u Bagrešku poljenu. I ljudi su se jako kratko zadržavali na vele sajmu. Onda su obrađivani u Bagreškoj poljeni. To, koliko sam ja čuo, je bila teška tortura. I koliko sam vidio. Vele sajam je izmišljen centar gdje se je moglo raditi sve što je tko htio. U početku je to bila prvo međuljska mržnja. Kao ti se meni zamjerio nešto do rata, pa ću ja tebi sad pokazati tko sam ja ili komu si ti to. I tako da je u 90. poslu čeva samo to. Ili imovinska strana. Jer ono vrijeme je bilo dovoljno da raspoložaš sa nekom većom svotom novaca, da ste odoznao da imaš u stanu ili u kući i da si nepretelj Hrvatske. Još pogotovo ako si Srbin. Pogotovo. Onda te ništa nije sprašavalo. Ništa od ove zakonite procedure se nije dešavalo. U ovim slučajevima su se dešavala hapšenja ili lješenja slobode bez naloga, bez opravdanja. Odvoženi su na Velesajam, oni koji su lišeni slobode na poziciju Zagreba i nakon toga, oni slučaje koji smo mi obrađivali, odvoženi su u Pakračku poljanu. Dovedeni ljudi na Velesajam većinom su bili svezani prvo u paviljon za stup, a potom u kontejneru koji je ministar rekao da se mora postaviti i da se unutra zadržava dovedene osobe da se unutra zadržavaju do transporta. Policija ima daleko sofisticiranija mjesta i metode nego što su kontejneri po vele sajmuna. I sad ti, te osobe koje su ih operativno urađivali, kako su nam to nazivali, da bi dokazali sebe i utjelo čim veći strah u te osobe, počeli su ih tući u jednom slučaju koliko ja znam i koliko sam vidio, još u samom stilu. I cijelim putem do paviljona 22. Pa nešto je bilo, ja ne znam kako to sad oni pričaju, bilo je hapšenja i nije bilo. Policija je radila svoj posao. Mi smo bili policija. Znači policija, jedan dio policije je radio svoj posao. Ja nisam nikoga hapsio, sigurno nikoga nisam dovodio, a jedan dio policije naše je, ispitivao i puštao ljudi. Nikakav tu zločaj nije bilo. A to što su neki posao i pogledali, to nije moja stvar. Svo ispitivanje se događalo u paviljonu 22 u kontenu ili u jednom od praznih paviljona. Da bi, kako se u paviljonu 22 često neko dolazio, ulazio, izlazio, većinom su tražili neki prazni paviljon. Jer se zatvorili i unutra su obrađivali osobe, kako su nam to nazivali. A su odlo se nasilovali na prebijanje. Tako da su poslije transporta u Baraško poljenu, nakon dan ili dva likvidirane. Ja sam znam, sjećam se pokon ova Đerela, mi smo dobili jedan kontejner od neki prijatelji iz Saumbora, mislim da su oni sad živi, imam ja to i zapisano kako zove, ako bude trebalo, i dobili smo kontejner, kada nema Đerela, bogate, ako te već dovodite nekoga ispitivati, jel? Nemojte mi u paviljon, jer će mi digniti neko utrak, svakaki ljudi ima, vodite i van, i ja sam njima postavio vani paviljon i ne znam više posle koga dovolili, šta su dovolili, to je, kak' je to, jaki zatvorenici, ako kontenerom može biti. A šta se događalo u tom paviljonu, ja ne znam, ja nijedan put nisam bio u paviljonu da sam bio tamo duže od 15 minuta, bio sam samo jedan put i to 15 minuta. Većina nas je u to vrijeme mislila, mada smo kasnije znali što se događa, s ljudima da radimo sve za dobro Hrvatske. Dok nismo doznali da je sve to iz neki materijalni, osnova, da ljudi nisu ništa počinili, onda je i nas, makar mene, počela peć savjest. Jer par ljudi sam i ja priveo, koji su likvidirani. Ne znam i šta će s njima biti. Ali u ono vrijeme vladao je u čovjeku jedan 
osjećaj da radi veliko dijelo za Hrvatsku, za obranu Hrvatske. Ja sam doznao za tu pojavu od jednog, možemo reći, oštećene žene koja je mene poznavala kao čovjeka iz civila još ranije i požalimo li se da su odveli jednog njeznog prijatelja ili ne znam, rođaka i da se nalazi negdje u Pakračkoj pojani. Ja sam nazvao tada šefa policije i pitan ga šta to, kakav to centar ima Kažnjenički u Poljani. Kaže, ja za centar nikakav ne znam Kažnjenički, ali mogu se raspitat kroz dva, tri dana dobit ćete informaciju. I mi smo vrlo brzo dobili informaciju da se to radi o Merčepovoj grupi koji, gdje su ljudi neki završili u tom Pakračkoj Poljani. Nekadašnji pripadnik takozvane Merčepove postrojbe Miroslav Bajramović u filmu govori da je na Velesajem dovedeno više desetaka ljudi koji su poslije nestali. Počinitelj zločina kaže uglavnom su se skrivali iza policijskih odora. Puno ilegala sabirni centar u kojem je vladala samovolja. Sam Merčep kazao je u filmu da je izraz Merčepovci obično udbaška poštapalica te da je u paviljonu bio samo jednom. Jel je jednog čovjeka sa vrbovnicam ovaj znao kom je došao? Koga je policija poslala? Da se toga primiti? Bio dužan primiti? Suđenje Mečepu nastavlja se 11. rujna, kada će svjedočiti Josip Manolić. Some additional information. So the last part was from television news, where you can find out that this film was used at the court trial against this guy, Mečep, as evidence. And... He was sentenced not only because of the film, but also because of what people are saying in the film. He was sentenced to seven years, which is nothing, but still something as a war criminal. Uh, now, there are a number of, as in any of the films I'm showing to you, there are here a number of ethical issues. And... Uh, I said once to one of my students, if your film doesn't raise any ethical issues, I'm not sure is it that it's really a good documentary. Because you know, uh, Shallow Focus, Beautiful Pictures, you know, Alexa, all of this, this is great. But we are telling stories about real people and real events. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, these stories have their consequences. My first uh, uh, dilemma was, should I take the guy as a main witness in the film, the guy you, you see? Uh, because he, he in, is himself a war criminal and he was also sentenced for that. Uh, I decided because I couldn't find anybody else who would like to speak about these issues that I will. I took only uh, the, the uh, parts of his testimony that I could check with other sources, not uh, film them, but written sources or sources from the uh, attorneys or... or, or papers or whatever. So I double check this information. Then uh, the other issue was that he wanted to be paid for that, which is not very often, but it's often the case. And he put it very strongly that if he's not paid, he's not going to, uh, uh, to do the film. So I was twice in my life uh, in this kind of situation and I decided that I would go somewhere uh, that I can uh, for the solution I would I can live with which was that people were paid per diem which means a daily um, how do you call it per diem is the expenses you are paid when you travel somewhere or do something. So it's not for what you do, it's uh, paying for your time. 
So we made a contract in which he uh, uh, and he agreed that he is going to be paid by day for the time he spent with us. And it doesn't have to do anything with what uh, he's going to say. It, it's a small sum, it's about, uh, I think it's about 20 euros a day, something like that. Uh, but this is, of course, an ethical issue. Uh, a next ethical issue, of course, is having your film being used in the court. Although the guy is guilty, and everybody in Croatia knows that he is an awful guy and that he is a criminal, uh, you have this uh, strange feeling that you've done a film which is used to put somebody for seven years uh, to prison. And you have to live with that. You have to live with all the decisions from this girl in the first film until uh, some other uh, uh, consequences later. And that's why it's, in my view at least, to do this kind of documentaries, and we are talking about human rights in very broad uh, definition, but still, it's not the easiest job in the world. Uh, it's much easier to make travelogues or to go, you know, to Nepal uh, to, sh to shoot, you know, 221st film about Nepal Buddhism or whatever. But to do this kind of films is tough. And uh, I can only tell you it, feel, it feels very often very lonely uh, because there are not many of your colleagues and many people together who are going to support you in this kind of uh, uh, issues, especially if there are issues which are not in sync with the official government policy, because uh, filmmakers depend on government sources very often, and there are not so many of them who are going to support you. Okay, um, I am going now to go to uh, another uh film uh, i'm going to go to a film i made in 2009 a film which deals with love now you say what has love to do with uh, a human uh, rights but this film again being myself is a film about struggle for love, struggle of people who have obstacles, uh, either uh, social uh, or, or physical or psychological obstacles. So uh, it's a film that deals uh, with guys in the wheelchair, with a lesbian couple, uh, with a widow, uh, 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 a woman who is now alone with uh, some very poor people and with a couple of uh, Down, Down syndrome a girl and a mentally handicapped guy. And um, for me, it was just a move into a different direction, but still, um, still talking. Uh, about uh, human rights, again, in a very broad, broad um, uh, view. So, uh, and the film is called very originally together. Dobro, kaj je ljubav osim peglati i čistiti? Ima još kaj je ljubavi? Ne znam, ko da me sačaro, znači, pa sam stalno išla s njime. Jednostavno, kad imate s nekim 
takvu bliskost, da vas neće otkantat kakvi god da jeste. A se želiš za tu osobu vezati? Ljubav je sad na prvo mjesto, više ne opire. Ti volim bi vidjeti sad, volim bi sad da mogu, ali ne mogu. Još malo nam je trebalo imali bi 40 godina brata. I moja familija ocijenila da to nije čovjek za mene. To je bilo i vođenja psihijatru, i izbacivanja iz kuće, i fizičnih prijetnji. On me pogleda, ti Boga, još i to. Jer smo nebo i zemlje. Ne znam, stvarno! Toga ću se sjeći do kraja života. A sada kad bi ja ovako pogledala, znate šta? Ko da mi nije to toliko prošlo. Ko da mi je to sada sve malo prekratko i prebrzo. Ne znam, ne znam uopće, ne znam što će biti. Strah me samoće. Ja ne znam biti sama. Sve sad nastupa ona emocionalna. Ja sad razmišljam da su mi frendovi zaručeni u braku, tako dalje, tako dalje. Dobio je prve bebače, peru pelene, tako dalje. A ti si ostao iza sve. I sad nastaje jedna prazna. A ljubav? Pa... Ljubav i dalje ide. Ok, obviously this is a bit different and it's a trailer, it's also film-wise different. The other films I show you, clips, longer clips. Sorry, and this is a trailer. But uh, again, uh, it was interesting that uh, in my country, the biggest issue, of course, was the lesbian couple, these two girls. And they split during the, the time we uh, shot the film, which was two and a half years. They split and uh, one of the girls went uh, for a scholarship to Siberia and uh, another state here. But what I really wanted to deal with is the fact that love uh, for most of the people is uh, today regarded as something that's normal, that uh, uh, you go to the supermarket and you, you take from the shelf, you know, the blue love or the red love or whatever. And people are not aware very often there are people who have to go through a lot of obstacles uh, even to be able to approach other people. We shot, uh, we shot more stories uh, than we edited. We, I shot also uh, a priest uh, who had to go out of the church because he wanted to marry uh, a girl he had fallen in love with. His bishop told him, come on, don't go out of the church, we'll do as always. She will be uh, your, you know, your help in the house. If, if you have children, we'll send you away for two years. You come back, it's normal. And he said, I don't want to live in life. We also shot another story about a transgender person. Uh, but we couldn't have the whole story. But anyhow, I, again, I wanted to tackle things that are not at that time, especially, it was almost 10 years ago, not very often dealt with. Today, a situation is different. Now, um, I want to show you two films, uh, two clips, two, two clips from films I produced, uh, which are dealing with uh, issues which are very personal. 
and uh, quite tough. Um, as I said, we are in a way, in fact, a kind of pioneers in autobiographical films. Uh, but when you do this kind of films, you really have to be very honest and very open. And you have all the time to, um, to uh, in a way, to have a fight with yourself. And um, it's not easy. Especially it's not easy when serious issues are uh, on stake. First, I will show you a, a, a clip from a film of my friend, very good friend. Uh, he's a writer and he, um, he's my generation. But uh, this film uh, that was shot in 2016 was his first film. He is a writer. But it's a great film, a film that won dozens of awards all around the world. Because it's called uh, Dum Spiro Spero, uh, which means I'm alive as long as I can breathe. Uh, the guy he has, uh, he is a heavy smoker and he can only use 20% of his lungs. Uh, and he still uh, smoked uh, until a year ago. But I want to show you this film because it's also a kind of, uh, of uh, fight for uh, truth and openness and uh, human rights. And we'll see what kind of human rights is here uh, he is dealing with. Što radim? Svašta. Pišem. Odgajam sina. Ipak, možda značajnije od svega u smislu da sve mu daje posebnu aromu, ono je što mi se događa. Umirem. Ne radim to tako kao što svatko umira od časa kad se rodi. Za to da umirem postaje prilično egzaktni pokazatelji. Ne mogu točno reći koliko sam u tome uznapredovao, nemam iskustva. Prvi put umirem, pa ne mogu točno precijeniti. Funkcionalno mi je manje od 20% pluća. Tako su mi barem rekli posljednji put kad sam bio na pregledu pri više od godinu dana. Trebao bih ići na kontrolne preglede svaka tri mjeseca, ali ne idem. Ne ide mi se. Jedino što mogu čuti da mi je gore, a to i onako i sam znam. Prva stvar koju mi svi doktori kažu svaki put jeste da bih trebao prestati pušiti. U pravo su. Jedino što mi to nikako ne uspjeva. Doktori neće koliko god sam ih gnjavio, jasno reći koliko ću joj živjeti ni na koji način ću skončati. Srećom, postoji internet. Dva su načina kako bi mi se to moglo dogoditi. Brzi i polagani. Prvo ono bolje, relativno brzo. Gripa ili upala pluća me sigurno odmah ubijaju. Viroza me može dotući, ali i ne mora. Najbrža i najbolja mogućnost je da će mi u nekom trenu srce popustiti. Ako će mi se to dogoditi, to će mi biti kao dobitak na lutriji. Ako mene do kosure gripa, upala pluća ili srce, perspektiva mi je da umrem nakon dugotrenog gušenja ili da se zbog pomanjkanja kesika razvije tumor u mozgu i skončam u sestravične glavobolje. 
Nijedna od tih polaganih perspektiva mi se ne dopada, ni gušenje, ni razdirujuća bol u glavi. Između toga dvoga ne znam što bi bilo gore. Da živim u Švicarskoj ili Nizozemskoj, gdje je eutanazija zakonom dozvoljena, ne bih toliko o tome razmišljao. No u katoličkoj zemlji u kojoj živimo, eutanazija je svetogrđe. Umiranje je preozbiljno da bi se prepustilo slučaju. Zbog toga razmišljam da svoj kraj nekako uzmem u svoje ruke. A to je tajna svetog bunila. Biti sam i hodati po krovu. I svojom vikom buditi sive i pospane ljude. To je tako i tako treba da bude. Skočiti s krova je brzo i jednostavno. U slučaju bacanja s krova Najbolje je to učiniti s najviše točke, da ne bih ostao sav skrhan, ali živ. Ovo je najviše točka na našoj kući, no ako bih se tu raspljeskao, točno ispred ulaza u puničin stan, bojim se da bih joj za dugo pokvario raspoloženje svaki put kad bi ulazila ili izlazila. Ovo su Dinkove knjige, knjige moga sina. I za vrata su one koje od mene posudio, pa ne vraća. Ovdje gledamo filmove. Ovo je naša dnevna soba na gornjem katu. Pod stropom su grobe, kao naručene. Vrlo povoljne za objesiti se da visim poput lustera. Vješanje je zgodno. Svatko može naći uže, a i kratko traje. No ovo nije dobro mjesto za objesiti se, jer je odmah ispred ulaza u sinovu sobu. Ne bi mogao izići ni ući u sobu da se ne prisjeti kako su me našli obješenog poput pršuta. Ovo je kada u jednoj kupovnici. Supruga provodi u njoj gotovo svakodnevno dugo vremena. Imamo dvije kupovnice na svakom katu po jednu. Ovo je kada u drugoj kupaonici. Leći u toplu vodu i prerazati žile. Uzeti neku dobru knjigu i prilistavati je tražeći omiljene dijelove dok se ne izgubi svijest. I sin često provodi mnogo vremena u kupaonici. Ne znam kako bi sin ili žena ikada ponovo legli u kadu nakon što bi mene iz nje izvukli. Možda bih mogao leći u škrinju za duboko smrzavanje kao u sarkofag. Kažu da je smrt smrzavanje blaga i bezbolna. Ono što me od toga maksimalno odbija je hladnoća. Nisam za zimske sportove. U ostalom, kad se spusti poklopac unutar nema svjetla pa se ne može ni čitati. Ovo su povijesne knjige. Knjige koje govore o povijesti. Polica je premala da u nju stanu sve knjige koje imamo o povijesti, pa ih je još ovoliko i na polici ispred kuhinje. Kroz vrata, pored povijesnih knjiga, ulazi se u garažu. To je mala garaža. Moj mali auto u nju jedva stane. Ovdje držimo stare Alan Fordove. Sjesti u auto, upaliti motor, pustiti neku dobru glazbu, uzeti neki Alan Ford za listanje 
pokušati posljednjih nekoliko cigareta. Da, to je to. Jedino što moram pripaziti da u rezervaru bude dovoljno benzina. Ako će mojima nakon toga neko vrijeme biti neugodno ulaziti u garažu, nije veliki problem. Može se živjeti i bez garaže. Otkako je oglušio, Bubble je postao jako glasan i javlja se češće nego ranije. Imam prijatelja liječnika koji živi u Kanadi. Svakog ljeta navrati u Zagreb i siti se napričamo. Kaže da primjećuje kod mene crtu depresivnosti. Savjetuje da bih trebao nabaviti mladog psa, živahnog, veselog, da mi ulije optimizma. Naravno, stari pas dijeluje upravo obrnuto. Pratiti kako kopni iz dana u dan nije ohrabrujuće. Razmišljanje o tome da li će prije umreti pas ili ja nije nešto što bi ikoga oraspoložilo. Suglasan sam s njim, savjet ima smisla. Jedino što imam starog psa i nema te cijene za kojih bih ga dao od sebe. Ok, this is more or less this. I have some more examples, but uh, we don't have any more time. Um, why is this about human rights? Because uh, a right, a right to, to die is one of the basic human rights. Unfortunately, in, still in uh, many, many countries in Europe and around the world, this is against the law. Um, uh, this film, uh, as you see, uh, with a touch of humor and uh, with uh, a very nice uh, uh, narration of the, the filmmaker, is really something that is advocating and showing why uh, one should be able uh, to ask for his or her end when the time comes. So I showed you a number of examples. There are many, many more. I produced uh, 85 films in, in 20 plus years. Not all of them, but most of them are dealing with human rights in very, as I said, a very broad sense. And um, we are going to continue doing it. Uh, one interesting thing maybe for uh, other filmmakers and other producers is that we never made a film outside uh, Croatia. We didn't go to China, we didn't go to Peru, we didn't go to, uh, uh, I don't know, to Canada or to South Africa. I personally don't believe in, uh, but that's a very personal statement. I don't believe in this kind of semi-documentary filmmaking, travelogue, tourism, when you go some, somewhere to a foreign country and to um, deal with people and cultures and languages you are not familiar with. But on the other hand, uh, there are so many stories around us there are so many stories in my own country in my own town in in my own street uh, in my own house that i think that i will always be able to find stories uh, around me also i have to tell you that i've done maybe from these 80 plus films maybe five that had a budget bigger than 75,000 euros, which is keeping us uh, really independent. They are not very rich and glossy productions, but they are productions uh, we uh, care for, 
And there are two things I say to all of the filmmakers uh, dealing uh, with issues and uh, working for Factum, which is uh, you are not going to become rich, but there are two things we can give you. The first thing is time, because sometimes we make films for five, six years. And the other thing is freedom. You can do whatever you want. There is no commissioning editor who is say, saying you can do this or you cannot do this, or there is not five commissioning editors saying for my slot this and for my slot that. We don't do that. Also, although it's very, very popular these days, we don't do a lot of uh, this kind of Euro pudding co-productions, uh, co you know, when you go around Europe from one pitching to another pitching to another pitching and pitch your film to one commission editor and then to another. Uh, uh, and then you add with so many comments and so many, uh, so many uh, uh, instructions or opinions about your film that a, it's very expensive that because this can take about 20% of your budget and B, uh, very often young uh, filmmakers get confused. So we do the way we do it. Uh, it's not the only way, it's not probably the best way, but as they say in America, that's our way. And um, obviously there is something in that because we are still working, we are at the moment working on six productions. That's all folks. And it's now, okay, I'm four minutes over the time. That's not bad. Yes, and I'm here with the questions. Okay. Can we watch your films? Well, we have uh, many of our films on our website uh, online. Uh, the www.factum.hr, factum.com.hr, which is Croatia, Croatia. And there are uh, there is uh, a possibility to watch a number of our films, not all of them, but most of them. Okay. So there is a way to do it. Okay, thank you. And the next question was, uh, what do you think is the biggest change in documentaries since you started directing? Well, as I said, I think the biggest change is that um, when I started directing, uh, a film was happening to somebody else. You know, normally you would, uh, when you would go to the shoot, there will be a big van coming in front of your house with a crew and equipment and all of this. You will kiss your wife goodbye and you will disappear for six months going somewhere uh, in exciting, part of the world, shooting films about other people, other cultures and other events. Today, it's quite normal that people are making films about themselves, their friends, their neighbors, their uh, lives. And I believe that this created a lot of this intimacy and this uh, closeness to uh, fiction in terms of storytelling and uh, believe that that's something that really change, change uh, 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 documentary filmmaking. And also uh, I started uh, some 30 years ago, I started in my film school with an uh, obligatory exercise which was called autobiography. And uh, I have to say that uh, it created a lot of great, great films. But there is another difference. 
which is not so uh, good, but it's how it is. And this is the documentary became business. When I started, documentary was not business. It was something between the culture and public uh, affair, but not business. There were no people making money apart from Disney and his films, you know, about animals and that kind of. But most of the documentaries were made uh, independently in film houses or on television, but they were not make, made with huge, uh, huge budgets and they were not made to, uh, to uh, gain a profit. Today it's changed and you, I've heard the other day a filmmaker who said, you know, I'm not going to even start this film if I don't have a million, a millionaire viewer. Okay, uh, that's also a, a possible view, but it's not my view. But that's really what happened. The budgets went out, uh, uh, much higher than when we started. You know, there, there were films we made for 10,000 euros, uh, but still went around festivals, awards. Okay. So that's the difference. Okay, thank you. Next question was, thank you for this deep insight into the profession. What advice would you give to yourself, your beginner filmmaker self? Well, advice is always uh, tough uh, because the only way, uh, apart from having uh, uh, a good uh, uh, teacher producer, is that you make your own mistakes. But I believe that uh, a good producer is important because good producer is somebody that um, keeps your back. That's basically. And today, a lot of producers became a kind of uh, 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 cashiers, you know, bank, bank uh, 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 money people, not really people understanding the uh, art and craft of uh, filmmaking. Uh, it, it's again a part of this new world of documentaries uh, where I remember once, uh, it, it happened uh, in Budapest, once I was a part of a pitching session and uh, there were a couple of Austrian young filmmakers uh, and we had the, a dinner together with a German uh, a producer and they said, look, uh, we need for our film only additional 10,000 euros. And he said then, I remember this well, he said, um, that's a problem, it's too cheap. Uh, we don't like cheap films. Uh, if you ask us 50,000, that's another, but for 10,000, we're not going yet. Uh, so we didn't even discuss the aesthetics, the story or whatever, but it was, you know, our, we want that you take our editor and our editor is more expensive than your editor, but only if our editor can be paid by our rates, blah, 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 blah. Again, trust yourself and understand that you will not, if you're not exception, you will not make a living only from uh, making uh, documentary films, most of the people. That's the reality in really independent documentaries, in my view. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you think about the trend that in more and more documentaries, directors put themselves in their films? So we have touched this topic yeah. a little okay. bit. Yeah, it's um, if it's justified. And if there, if a person uh, can uh, share an interesting uh, story, uh, that's okay for me. Uh, but sometimes, uh, of course, it's not 
uh, structurally or dramaturgically necessary. Sometimes you do it uh, because it's easier, or sometimes you do it because you don't know what else to do. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not about the fact of somebody's life. It's about life. It's about how a person can make the film. Uh, but as I said, I think that's great that we can do it. Uh, on the other hand, the new technologies and internet produce so many opportunities for everybody to put anything online and to produce films that we are uh, over, uh, overwhelmed at, oversaturated uh, with thousands of different video uh, content, as they would say. But again, this is just making a life of us uh, festival selectors uh, much tougher because I have to see about 12, 1500 films a year. And that's not easy um, because uh, uh, production is huge, but you know more doesn't really mean uh, better. So um, again, that's the reason why I told you that my student film was shot with the uh, ratio of material one to four. So I didn't have uh, DV cassette or I didn't have the, the memory card. I had, you know, 60 mil roll of 10 minutes and I, I got, uh, I got, uh, uh, eight rolls uh, of material for two roll film. And that's it. And many people talk a lot in my film. So you had to really to think a lot before pressing the button on the camera. That's uh, a kind of selection today. If my students came with less than 50 hours, they would say that that's not a film, even that's just a sketch. You know, from 100 hours up, that's a serious film. It's just, they're just making themselves life more complicated, but what can you do? That's their choice. But again, uh, yeah, it's not a rule uh, to make films about yourself, but if there is something that you really uh, want to say, you can say it directly instead of uh, 50 years ago, you wouldn't dare to do it because you would be accused that you are egocentric, egomaniac or whatever. Yeah. Um, okay, how and why did you decide to make the film about love? Well, I, I said very often, you know, that if I made this film when I was 25, it will be a completely different film. Um, I made this uh, film with, when I was uh, between 50 and 60. And then you understand that love is worth to fight for. It's not something you are given on a silver uh, plate. And as in most uh, valuable things in life, at least my generation was uh, brought up to believe that you have to fight for it. You have to do something. It's not happening by itself. It's great if it does. It's great. But you know, for, uh, for a real relationship, in my view at least, you have really to work for it. And I saw, I put together a number of, of couples or people who really had to uh, went through obstacles even to be able to come to the zero point which we take for granted for example the guy in a wheelchair he uh and it's in the film of course he very uh, often i ask him once look why don't you have this electric wheelchair you know with the motor which goes around fancy and he said, you know what, I'm saving money. I said, what for? I said, I'm saving money because 
I use this money to pay a prostitute. And I know, and I spoke to the, she didn't want to be a film, but I spoke to the lady. And she really uh, took care of him in the, in the nicest way, um, taking time with him and, you know, um, taking care of him and so on and so on and so on. <coughs> Not only taking the money. So, but he still, as he said in the film, he still wanted a real love and he he, uh, he he found a girl uh, online in Germany, and he, with his wheelchair he went to Germany uh, uh, to meet the girl and to spend some time together. It didn't work, but then he came back. He was uh, uh, down, which we also have in in the film. But now he has a, a girlfriend. And funny enough, she is in a wheelchair because in a way he wanted to prove that he can have a girl, normal girl, you know. And there's a parallel story, which is in the trailer, where they showed this couple, both of them in a wheelchair. And uh, the guy has electric wheelchair and the girl is, you know, just grabbing his wheelchair, they're going together. And it's a beautiful scene. Uh, and they live together and they help each other and so on and so on. So they said, well, his problem, the problem of my character is that he wanted to prove that he can have any girl. And he can't. Uh, so you see, uh, what we are taking for granted, going to the disco, going to the coffee shop, or doing this or the, doing that, uh, there are some people who cannot, for example, the... Uh, the, um, the, the Down syndrome uh, girl and the uh, mentally handicapped guy. Uh, they are they've been together for years. They live uh, in an apartment. They are part of inclusion uh, project, and there are people come coming to the home helping them. And uh, they were they live norm normally. Uh, uh, and they, uh, I can say they're very happy. They're very happy. So, again, uh, I wanted to show that it's something that's worthwhile uh, fighting for. Okay, and the next question is about this as well. How did you find the main protagonists? How did I find? The main protagonists of the film. Of this film? So, yes. Well, I, I had a researcher uh, and a very nice, capable uh, young woman. And we found uh, about 10, 10 uh, different... I, I said what kind of uh, problems I want people to have. Uh, what kind of stories I need. So she was going around and uh, finding uh, stories. And then finally we select uh, some, I think, seven, eight stories, which we shot and then we put six in the film. Uh, I told you that there were some stories uh, we didn't uh, we didn't find the place for in the film. Although I'm sorry about that, but that's how it how it that's how filmmaking works. Uh, it took us about a year and a half to find these people. Um, there was one story there. which was the most risky one, which I wanted to find. I couldn't in Croatia at least, which is the kind of incest uh, when it's not really what people usually believe incest is, which is a kind of abuse and you know, all this kind of terrible stuff, but it's about people who, I don't know, a brother who lived all, all, all his life in America and a girl in Slovenia, and they found themselves after 25 years and fall in love. This kind of 
I wanted to show this because this is one of the still rare uh, 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 kind of the stories which are completely taboo, but we couldn't find it. Uh, at least we couldn't. We, we found two stories, but we couldn't find the uh, people who would really uh, like to be in front of the camera. Um, be, uh, talking about being in front of the camera, we are a very shy culture and it's very difficult to get people in front of the camera. And I believe that most of the time I can make people talk. Uh, but uh, not in, in this in this situation it was too too problematic because it's about ninety nine percent of 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 people who would immediately judge them and they didn't want it. Okay. Um, next question: Do you still work as a director? Yes, my last film was. Uh, this uh, I didn't have time. I, my last film was three years ago, and I'm working on a couple of new projects. But at the moment, um, at the moment, and it's funny because not funny, you know, because the, my last film is about 1968, uh, and it's about the revolution and student movement and so on and so on. Uh, it's a very personal film when I go around the world and find some friends of mine who, uh, who are together with me and hoping for the better world and more just and, you know, love, peace uh, and freedom. And uh, I, I smuggled, a, it's interesting because I smuggled a lot of small, very, very intimate details in it. And some people uh, know and uh, find out about it, some people don't. And it was one of the things I like uh, very much that only myself and maybe 10 people know specific details uh, which I was uh, putting in the film. So it, again, it's something I, I, I like to do, uh, trying to find out, you know, the structure that on one layer level is giving uh, average uh, viewer one information, but there are many layers uh, for people who know more or who would uh, like to find out more. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still working. You have to know that I I uh, I uh, learned how to uh, drive uh, when I was uh, 58. So um, oh. I'm quite tough, and I I drew to Budapest. So uh, I'm still working and still uh, functioning. <laughs> Good. Um. So. There was a question about um, pitching forums. So you would not recommend filmmakers to go to pitching sessions? No, I would recommend because today it's so normal that it's becoming a bit boring how normal it is. But you know, you, again, I don't want, uh, I, I became a producer when I was 40. And I did my share of films. I, as you see, I even did uh, I even did a, a, a Eurovision Song Contest. I did a lot of theater. I experienced, I did uh, fiction for television. So I've done a lot of things uh, and I had uh, quite an experience, both life and professional, started being a producer. And I think, especially in documentary, uh, producer is important. So if you have a producer um, with experience, with knowledge, who will uh, take you by hand, not literally, of course, but take you by hand through the process and tell you, okay, this is serious, this is not serious, uh, then I think it's great 
to go to a couple of pitching sessions. But you know, I know people who go to who went to Itfa and to Leipzig and to this and to that, and then they finish with paying five, six, seven thousand uh, euros just for that. To you know, for the tick, uh, for the airplane ticket, for the hotels, for the uh, uh, fees, blah 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 blah, and then. Uh, in the end of the day, especially today, you have commission gatherers who are very nice people, but who say to you, uh, okay, uh, but you know, I'm not really making the final decision. I have to speak to my colleagues. So, uh, and you know, it's not really happening on the spot. And if it is, it depends how much money you can get and also depends on the strings attached which is, is it my version, is it your version, is it my slot 50 minutes, is it my slot 70 minutes, is it art or BBC? <coughs> so there are many, many issues here. Is it my cinematographer or is it a, a, a Dutch cinematographer because it has to be by the law of the Dutch, uh, if it's a Dutch money, I'm inventing. If it's a Dutch money, it has to be a Dutch creative, blah, blah. So uh, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, it became normal. I think uh, it shouldn't be taken for granted. I think it's great that we have it. We have it in Zagreb also, but we are trying to have it on in a very human, human uh, 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 way, uh, talking to the people. But basically today, it's not that you will get the money in the pitching session. You will get a lot of advices and you have to be clever enough to find out the way to use these advices. Um, because again, if you are young and unexperienced, you can be confused by all of them uh, because they can be very, very different uh, and they can be uh, different from what you want to do. So altogether, cum grano salis, as they said in old days in Latin, which means with a bit of salt, uh, with a bit of doubt, uh, I think is great, but it's not absolutely great. Hmm. Okay, one last really quick question because we are out of time. Um, and this is, uh, I think, a good last question. What do you recommend to young directors? I recommend to young directors, uh, as I said, uh, to, be, to be truthful to, uh, to themselves. Uh, it's very simple. You have to understand that you will be in the profession for the next 40, 50 years, if you're lucky. To be in the profession for 40, 50 years means a number of things means first to uh, be able to have this creative energy uh, it's also um, what we uh, tackle today is to be true yourself and also to be able to sleep to sleep with the consequences of what you do uh, with the people you you shot uh, in your films, with the characters, uh, with uh, what happened to your film, with yourself. So it's really, uh, it's really a marathon. It's not a, a sprint. It's not even a, a medium. It's a marathon. And you have to, from the beginning, beginning to think uh, about it as a marathon. I know when you are 25, it doesn't uh, seem like you're talking about tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. But it's not that, it's about, you know, in 25 years, when you look back, what are you going to see? Are you going to be happy? Are you going to be proud about what you uh, uh, did? Uh, proud in terms of what did I do for, not myself and my, my awards and my diplomas on the wall and my awards on the shelf, but what did I do for the benefit of my my friends, my, my uh, family, 
myself, my country, my society. And I think that's what, uh, what, uh, uh, what it's all about. It's not about red carpet. It's not about fame. It's not about beautiful women and, you know, Oscars. It's tough work. Uh, it's uh, not a lot of money. So you have really to be crazy to do it. Okay, I think this is a really nice ending to, to this session. Thank you very much, Nanat, for being here and for this very, very interesting masterclass. And so thank you to all the people who are listening to you and making the questions. Thank you, guys and so girls. Thank you. Thank you and see you around in flesh, as they say, uh, sooner or later, hopefully sooner. Hopefully. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.